Dr. Ashwin Desai has applied his training as a sociologist to bring the human aspects of history to life, especially in telling the story of the indentured workers. It's all a part of the epic African journey of the Indian diaspora, as he explains. For privileged young South Africans, working, studying and travelling abroad has become a rite of passage. But for the Indians that travelled to South Africa in the 1860s, there were no such privileges. It's hard to imagine today what the life of an indentured labourer was like. And I have the honour and privilege of chatting to Professor Ashwin Desai to find out what it took to survive. Ashwin, what a pleasure. Great to meet you. This is such an amazing bookshop. Yep, I, I want to pack this bookshop up and take it home. Have you always had a love for reading and books? No. <laughs> I, I was brought up in the Casper in the middle of Durban, where there were movie houses. And all I wanted to do was to watch John Wayne. So where did your love for reading come from? Well, my mother forced it down my throat. She would collect the shoe boxes, cut them into pieces, and make words and ask me to repeat those words that she read from books. What made you want to tell the story of the journey of Indians to South Africa? In the archives, Professor Ghulam Vahid and I were able to build incredible stories of the Indian indentured laborers from the time they jumped on the ship and came across. But on the ship itself, there were revolutions happening. They didn't know each other. And so even there, things started to change dramatically because if you were a Brahmin and you didn't want to eat from an untouchable, well, you'll, go, you'll starve. And people even named those ships the Temple of Jagannath because the Temple of Jagannath means no caste. There were brutal things that happened. And up to today, I'm still haunted by the story of Munya Ma. She was chained to a pole because she supposedly had transgressed some norms on the ship and she was basically defecating while she was chained. They finally released her so that she could go to the toilet and she just jumped over the ship and committed suicide. Many of these stories are told in the book Inside Indian Indenture that Professor Ghulam Vahid and I wrote. Ashwin, tell me about Indians that did eventually come to South Africa. Well, it was a motley crew, Karusha, because uh, one must remember by now, India was under British rule. So some were forced out of their traditional ways of life and were looking for a new way of life. Others were simple adventurers, hoping for, for something new. And you had uh, recruiters that were going around enticing people, saying that we could take you to a place of gold, where you'd come back to India as the richest person in the world. And what were the conditions actually like when they got to South Africa versus what they were promised? Once they landed here, a new shock awaited them because the way they were allocated to the plantations was arbitrary. And then they were put on the road to walk Tom Zinto and Amkumas. And there are stories where women, for example, were pregnant and many of them lost their children or gave birth on the road. Just think about the multiple sense of loss and the multiple sense of having a new life uh, that they thought they had signed up for, but was completely the opposite of what they had signed up for. Indenture entail that you got up at sunrise, you labored on the fields to sunset. You would be given food and you would be given a small amount of money. In reality, what happened was that many people who returned to India uh, ended up having no money because every small infraction that they made. Every small trespass was fined. So they worked for five years, went back to India and found they had nothing. And what was life like for the indenturer that decided to stay in South Africa? Ways were found to ensure that the Indian indentured labourer re-indentured. There was a trick, an easy trick, that the indentured had to pay a three pound tax. If you couldn't come up with a three pound tax, you had to re-indenture. So many people indentured for five years, 10 years, 15 years. But those who then managed to get plots of land started to build a new life. Many became small market gardeners. Many started to sell their produce. And so life was starting to emerge uh, on African soil as, as people whose futures were always going to be in Africa. Do you think that's how the Indian diaspora in South Africa has managed to keep their culture and religion alive? As much as indenture was bad, I think the pluses about indenture is that people, if you wanted to worry about caste and you were upper caste or you were fair, well, you'll never get married. These people, 
who come here and talk about culture and religion standing still. Well, they should come and look at us. We can teach them a thing or two in South Africa about culture because here culture is often overturned. We want to reach out as if there's some authentic India. There's no authentic India. It's commodified, it's commercialized, it's been made up. And what is your opinion on where Indians find themselves in the current South African context? The racist rhetoric has increased and it comes on both sides. There are those Indians who still believe that they are better, they're superior. Those people need to be isolated or educated. Who do you think worked in the mines and built this country? On the other hand, there's an African chauvinism because they purportedly are indigenous. Every other racial group in South Africa must be treated as foreigners, as outsiders. Well, I can tell you, in the pages of this book, there's a family at the end of the 1920s, the Munshi family. They went back to India and they keep writing for over a decade to the British authorities saying we need to come back to South Africa. And they say, we are in a foreign land, India. This is not our native land. We want to come back to our motherland. We are Africans. Our histories are written into the very landscapes of South Africa. And so what is the value of history? The value of history is to say that, yes, you've been through lots of trials. I mean, just think, in 1952, on the very streets of Durban, there was a defiance campaign where Indian and African marched together. In order to answer those questions, of course, we must look at the contemporary, but we must draw inspiration from our histories. So would you describe the Indian South African story as one of resilience and overcoming? It contains that, uh, definitely. But you know, sometimes these words, rather than uh, giving you a sense of what a people are like, box them in. How are we able to reach out beyond the confines of this thing called Indian? It's fraying at the edges. Some people want to pull it back. I want it to fray a lot. You know, I went to India for the first time in 2001 and my friends waited for me when I came back. And they're all sitting there and they asked me, hey Ash, how was it? And I said, I spent 50,000 Rand to only realize I'm not an Indian. So Ashwin, what is next for you? The one book that Gulam and I are working on is gonna be our best piece of work. It's called The Many Biographies of Indian South Africans, 1990 to 2019. And it's really a racy kaleidoscope of exactly what we've been talking about, this community in motion, in movement. Looking at the changes, the new icons that come up, the Indians who marry multiple times, they're gay Indians, they're transgender Indians, you know, they're short Indians, tall Indians, because there isn't some mold. And, and that's what we must stop doing, uh, stop having the stereotype. Our challenge then is to show it, not because we're making it up, because we see it in the streets of Durban and all over South Africa. It's a community that is always in motion, always reaching out, always stretching this idea of what it is to be Indian, redefining it, and then that's its power. Ashwin, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it's been for me to meet with you today. I've always been such a big fan, and this experience has exceeded every expectation. Thank you so much for spending time with me. Thank you. When I travel today, I swipe my phone a few times and I know exactly where I'm going. I can take a virtual tour of my destination. The Indians that came here in 1860 had no idea what was waiting for them. And although their beginnings were humble, to say the least, they've left us a legacy of great integrity, resourcefulness and tenacity.